Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is ThinkTech, of course, at two o'clock on a given Thursday. And it's the military in Hawaii standing with Ukraine. I love that term. Uh, and we have thoughts and, and, and comments with Lieutenant General uh, Dan Figleaf today. He's one of our directors, and he's also a host in multiple shows here on ThinkTech. So thank you for joining us, Dan. I really appreciate your appearing on military in Hawaii, and I also appreciate your thoughts on Ukraine. Uh, oh, I'm looking forward to your thoughts. Thanks, Jay, and uh, I'm proud to do this as part of the Military Affairs Council of the uh, Chamber of Commerce here on Oahu. So we have a, a situation where um, there's a there's a renegade among us, um, um, Putin, and you know we can talk about his psychology some other time. But here he is using a whole bunch of tricks in a hybrid war, an invasion, if you will, of Ukraine uh, for reasons that are hmm, hard to understand. But the bottom line is um, he is he's involved in a genocide. He's trying to make rubble out of the whole country. And um, you know, Western Europe, not clear exactly what to do to stop him. And the US, not clear exactly what to do to stop him. And um, we have to find a, a moral position, uh, and we have to do what we can to stop him. And so far, that hasn't happened. Um, uh, Jay, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, no, Jay, I think you're right. There's been a lot to punish him, um, but not measures that have made him stop. And, and, and the whole thing is stops, about, it's the whole really thing is about nuclear war. It's about threatening nuclear war and, uh, and threatening, which is a serious threat, and threatening chemical war and biological warfare. Um, and all this has kind of gotten the world stymied. And the United Nations, uh, because he's on the Security Council, can't really do too much about it. So the United Nations is really not actively involved. And so the question is, uh, and you know, you're an essential thinker, uh, you know, from and with the United States military, we are very interested to hear your thoughts about where we are on this, what we can do, okay. what our options are, and how it affects the liberal world order and, and other relationships in the world. Well, I'd start by saying it affects the fundamental underpinnings of civilization <laughs> and that try not to resort to hyperbole in the modern world, in the modern in interconnected uh, by both information and economy world. Because you have somebody who is basically flipping a nuclear tip middle finger to the world order. And that's bad enough, but he's doing it with the tacit support of another nuclear tip. And I wouldn't say that Xi Jinping and China are as much flaunting the world order, but they're not supporting it either. And that that's a ripping of the fabric of peaceful civil, civilization that we should all be worried about. And this is a big deal, and being mad as hell about it is not good enough. So sanctions, which also have second and third order consequences, there's collateral damage, and I'm not against them, I'm just saying, as you alluded to in your lead-in, um, until it stops and his and Putin's invasion of Ukraine is thwarted, and his ambitions, which are likely the Donbas region in eastern Ukraine and Black Sea port access for him denying it to Ukraine, if he gets either of those, and certainly both of those, then he's actually won, no matter how deeply stained his image is. And uh, we, we, the world, can't afford that. And it has very significant um, future consequences. The outcome of this will have very significant future consequences for the US, even for the military in Hawaii. And you know, here we are in our beautiful state and it, it isn't as much of a situation we're involved in as, as we have been, say, in Iraq or Afghanistan, sending forces there. But this matters to all of us. Do, do you mind if I say that uh, even the end won't be the end? Um, it, that it's likely to change the border. But then if you look at um, you know Europe, and especially Eastern yeah. Europe over the past thousand years, 
the borders of those countries has changed over and over a hundred, a thousand times in that period. And so if he gets a piece of Eastern Ukraine, um, you know, um, the Balkans um, and, um, you know, the countries in, you know, the, in the northern area on the Baltic, um, they're also at risk. Uh, if he takes one piece, it will embolden him to go for other pieces. Don't you agree? Um, kind of. But, it, you know, that's a little reminiscent of the domino theories around Southeast Asia in the 60s and 70s. Um, I look more, and you're the lawyer, Jay, so I shouldn't even use this word in your presence, but it's more a matter of precedent. <clears throat> Do we allow this kind of a challenge to the established rules-based order in the international community? Um, because it's different. There's been internal strife. There have been transnational terrorism threats, but one sovereign nation invading another, occupying its territory, Crimea was a little different. But this is this is in your an in your face challenge to what to the fabric of a relatively peaceful world. So how far should we rise up now? Uh, we haven't stopped him yet. The sanctions he blows off the sanctions. He's still selling oil. You know, he's still selling oil even on Nord Stream 1, which is active to Germany right now. Uh, he's still selling oil to, uh, you know, India and to uh, China, for that matter. Um, we haven't stopped him. And so and, and of course, we, we have held back, um, not wanting to create a, a ground war, even though we, you know, we're in kind of a non- You're Maripol or Bucha, it's a ground war. We're just yeah. not in it. Yeah. And so... Um, that's a very difficult question. Uh, the second sort of the, um, the, the elephant in the room of, of tolerating this invasion, even if you get all upset about it and sanction it, is the fact that our reluctance is based largely on his military, on Putin and Russia's military capability, understandably. Okay. I, I was an F-4 nuke strike by, nuclear strike pilot in the 70s, certified to go against targets in the Warsaw Pact. That's not something we want to see. And the new, nuclear weapons are more different than the world can imagine. Here's a question but, for but, you. But I'll... here, let me, let me get to this, Jay, if I can. But if we let him use nuclear blackmail, that we're opening the door to proliferation and more nuclear blackmail by other powers. Um, so I think, I think we've got to be pretty imaginative about what we do to compel him to cease and desist. You know, the notion of deterrence over the entire duration of the Cold War was that we didn't want to do it, and they didn't want to do it, and we might threaten and posture, mm -hmm. but neither one of them, neither one of us really wanted to do it. Does that still play? Or should we believe that he will do it if pushed? Uh, are, are we in a different kind of deterrence now? I think we're in a more complicated deterrence um, based on two elements that I've already touched upon. One being the global interconnectivity of ec economics and information. And um, the other element being time since 1945 time since nuclear weapons were last used in combat and the fading and the stark memory of everybody who wasn't around then including me but i've been to hiroshima and i've i've sat in an f4 with a nuclear weapon on it so i gave a pretty good appreciation nuclear weapons and nuclear war are different but we can't you know we can't be fully deterred by his threats because we have a very capable nuclear arsenal. God, I don't, I don't even want to go there. But we can't let him, we can't let Putin and Russia control the world. How do we stop arsenal. him from that blackmail? I think we, um, everything that makes his situation in Ukraine unsuccessful and untenable is how I think a lot of that has been done. I mean, there's there's a lot good. You can be, we can be pretty optimistic. Jay, you and I could be sitting and sipping a beer and 
name of the bar in Waikiki, and I could be talking about all these things. The Russian plan is not survived first contact. No plan does, but this one in particular looks awful. Um, the UK, the Ukraine's resolve and the quality of their national leadership is far beyond what anybody expected. Russia has an established air superiority. My last figment, uh, The Power of Imagination, talks about that in detail. Please check that on the Think Tech playlist. Uh, in, Ukraine is winning information ops, hands down. You're alluding to genocide and war crimes. But frankly, I'm going to be a bit of a devil's advocate and say we don't know yet, because I've been in wars where war crimes were both alleged and committed and and it it's we don't know yet it's likely if i had to put my money on who's the bad guy here it's russia and the and putin but we don't know it doesn't matter because ukraine has won the information operations war uh, the ukraines have been incredibly innovative using hobby drones and other things i mean they're they're doing some really good stuff that the as somebody who thinks about war more than i should perhaps I'm really impressed with none. And by the way, the uh, Moscow is now an artificial reef on the bottom of the, of the Black Sea. And that's a big deal. Absolutely none of that guarantees that Ukraine will win. None what about this notion of war <clears throat> without attacking civilians? I mean, back in the days of the revolution, the civilians would stand alongside the field and the redcoats would, would shoot at the revolutionaries and and the and the and the ordinary civilians were not at risk, but that everything has changed now. The well, civilians become matter, the yeah. target. It's a matter of range and explosive potential. Okay, so back then, I'm going to guess at this, but um, I, I suspect the maximum range of any weapon on the battlefield, including artillery, was approximately 200 yards, maybe 300. I, do, I don't know what a revolutionary cannon could shoot, but it wasn't five miles or 50 miles, okay? And the explosive weight was, you know, ball about the size of a volleyball. And so, so you could, it wasn't precision, it was potential. So the civilians were relatively close. Doesn't mean that if you go through history and look at the Mongols and Romans and everybody, <laughs> there have been atrocities against humans. They were just up close and personal, but they weren't uh, a target. That changed with the Japanese bombing of China in World, in World War II, in, in, the, in the Japanese incursion into China. And it became an accepted horrible practice. Um, civilian casualties became accepted, and that's that's a whole other uh, PhD dissertation I'll never do about the acceptance of civilian casualties. But but it became normalized, and while we seek to avoid it, it is going to happen now because of the range and explosive potential of the weapons that are used. Well, do you think that more ammunition, more artillery, more you know missiles and anti-aircraft? type, um, you know, devices will will help, uh, I mean, more than we are standing over there now. I mean, every day or every couple of days you hear about the uh, United States sending, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of, uh, of, uh, of um, you know, weapons uh, to Ukraine. But will it help? Do we have to step it up to some other level entirely? Yeah, step it up to some other level doesn't necessarily need to be mean um, more bombs, bullets, missiles, or boots on the ground. Um, and I'm not in the Pentagon or at UCOM or my old former colleague, Todd Walters, has got the interesting job of being the Supreme Allied Commander Group. So I don't know what's being done, but I hope we're being very imaginative because what should be done is to, uh, is, uh, a number of efforts to thwart um, Putin's ambition by making it really difficult for him in, a, in imaginative, perplexing crap. Now what ways? And I'll give you an example. As I said on Figment's no-fly zone discussion drove me crazy. First of all, we shouldn't have been discussing it in public. That should have been done in secret. And secondly, no-fly zones aren't an instrument of war. Okay. 
But there were other things that could have been done. It's too late now. In the Korean War, the Russians and Chinese flew MiGs out of Antung near Dandong, China, and uh, operated out of sanctuary, sanctuary and really gave US F-86 and B-29 pilots and F-86 crews, <laughs> F-86 pilots, B-29 crews, a very difficult time. Okay, That could have been an option. There are cyber options. There are are other, you know, exquisite ways to make it tough for Putin and Russia. And uh, I would not, I would not uh, suggest that we can raise the price of victory to him because I don't think Vladimir Putin cares about price. We have to decrease the potential for victory by his definition. And I think to do that, we need to fully understand that his definition of victory is most likely um, annexation of the Donbass region and unimpeded access to the Black Sea ports and denying said access to Ukraine. It strikes so, me, it strikes me, this is so interesting and I really appreciate your thought on it. It strikes me that when, um, you know, he takes the position and it's, it's an old Russian cultural point of attacking civilians, um, he's spending more time um, and more weapons on attacking civilians than he is on attacking the Ukraine army. It's almost like he wants to get out of the way of the Ukraine army because they create a, a, a more serious challenge for him and just kill civilians as much as possible. Yeah. A avoid the Ukraine army. I, right? I, yeah, I don't know about that, but I do know that the, the Russians historically did not care about Ukraine civilians. During uh, Operation Barbarossa, when Hitler invaded Russia, one, the Soviet Union time, there were three access axes of attack. One of them, the southern one, was through Ukraine. And during retreat, the Soviet army uh, breached a dam uh, in Ukraine to impede Nazi advance that killed nearly instantly 100,000 Ukrainians, 100,000. So we ought not be surprised about anything, but that we ought not expect any consideration of human casualties from Putin and the Russian armed forces. Well, the, and the other issue is, um, and we're getting to the point of humanitarian here in a minute, yeah. The other issue is, um, you know, the the uh, Russian troops uh, seem to be out of control, uh, shooting people, blindfolding them, shooting him in the in the head, in the eye, uh, shooting him at random on the street while they're walking with with groceries or riding their bikes. Uh, you know, it's it's um, it's outrageous, and um, and raping, raping the women, and killing the children, and and one says, well, this is um, this is what the Russians do. But gee whiz, uh, uh, in an army, uh, shouldn't there be some discipline? Is it that we do, that they don't do discipline? They don't care. He doesn't care about how they conduct themselves day to day. Well, let's uh, just look at war and back away from the specificity of Russia. This is war, and and we've had some kind of unique, limited conflicts. This is real war in a country the size of Texas with forty-ish million people. And, and rape happens more. I'm absolutely not excusing it. I'm just saying this is it. It's made worse by an army of conscripts that is ill-disciplined. It's been proven that way. But on the other hand, and this is a lesson, I hope we'll get to talk a little bit about what China is taking from this situation with regard to Taiwan, because this is a pretty seasoned Russian military. They've fought in Syria and Afghanistan, et cetera. They've got significant combat experience and they've got pretty good gear. Mm -hmm. If they're faring this badly, uh, there's a lesson there for any other adventurous. Well, let's talk about that. Um, you know, what, what is the lesson? What are the lessons that we um, have learned or should learn and what is the lesson that other, um, you know, autocratic governments in the world uh, have learned or should learn? Yeah, let me um, let me start by saying I think the uh, President Xi and the People's Republic of China are 
are going to learn a lesson about international response, even though it hasn't stopped the uh, military action by Russia, the international response, when you get countries like Germany and Switzerland even uh, weighing in against the Russian invasion, that is very significant. Um, and now you've got Xi Jinping aligning himself with President Putin, declaring a relationship partnership that has no boundaries. That, that's a little weird, frankly. Uh, it's a very unusual for China, Russia, China, Russia, USSR, PRC. It's always been a bit of an arranged marriage that broke up at the first argument. And um, boy, if, if, if not, not about to tell President Xi what to do, but I would not want to be you know, find, uh, I would not want to be on Putin's friend list right now in the international community, not a good thing. But what should all of us learn with regard to military adventurism? And I'll use as an example, the potential for a military unification of, of Taiwan initiated by China. Um, here's what we ought to learn. First of all, people defend their homeland. When it's your house, you're going to fight for it. And the focus groups in Taiwan say that, uh, though it's, it's long been doubted, would the Taiwans fight for Taiwan? Uh, both the example in Ukraine and, and what we know from, from public opinion polls, so, yeah, they'll fight for it. History matters. I talked about some of the history between Ukraine and Russia when they were both part of the USSR. There's a long history in Taiwan. I don't have time to go into it. Um, that that matters not just between the mainland government and the people of Taiwan, but in how hard a place it is to occupy. Nobody else has succeeded. Um, there is no. They ought to learn that that access and resupply is really difficult in Ukraine. That the you saw the stalled convoys and everything else. Right. Well, that's with uh, several borders between Russia and Ukraine, uh, Belarus, you know, co-conspirator. There's a lot of land access to to uh, the Ukraine, and it's still been very difficult for Russia to resupply its forces and to invade and then resupply. There's only water around Taiwan. So the notion that, that China can sustain a military operation there, good luck. Um, and I'm not being flippant, good luck, because what access there is, I've been on, or actually been on almost every square mile of the main island of Taiwan, and the beach access is very difficult, what there is, and as soon as you finish that, you're in agricultural wetland, urban area, and then very quickly abrupt mountains that would remind you of the coal logs. Good luck on a, a country that there are 13,000 square miles to Taiwan, I think in 233,000 to Ukraine, but they've got 24 million people in Taiwan. So what land there is, is heavily populated. Um, and a why, very- Why is she so friendly then with Russia now? What is I it for him? I don't know. I, and people, I, people speculate yeah. that he, he thinks that if Putin succeeds in Ukraine, um, that that will uh, somehow be a, a message to him that he is more likely to succeed in Taiwan. He will be emboldened, uh, you know, by Putin, any success by Putin in Ukraine. Um, are you saying that that is, that is not happening or it is happening? In a I, way I think it, it could happen, but it would be a, it would be a bad idea. I mean, it, 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 any, uh, in my military judgment, any military action to forcibly take Taiwan is doomed to a long and bloody failure. And uh, I, I just think that the problem set is so much more complex than that in Ukraine. We've already seen how complex it is. So why do it? But um, my concern is that maybe the motivation is to try to deliver a death knell to the rules-based order that's sustained our civilization for a few decades. What does that mean? Oh, I'm, I'm so interested that, to know how you feel, you know, that would work out. That, I think that would work out with um, 
not Russia, because Russia is not as, other than its nuclear weapons, and to a lesser degree, its energy, it's not as significant as China. Sorry, Russia, it's not. China is a very significant player. It would mean a circumstance where the People's Republic of China could dictate terms of damn near everything to the rest of the world. Okay, South China Sea is our lake. Okay, we are going to take the fish from uh, the Indo-Asia Pacific region and feed our people first and your people last. Uh, we are going to control the global economy through cyber currency on their terms. Um, and that's, let's see, who else does that benefit? Nobody, nobody. <laughs> So what about uh, Hawaii? You know, uh, we have uh, significant forces mm -hmm. here and equipment here. Um, um, and uh, we, we see Hawaii as projecting power all across the Indo-Pacific uh, area. Uh, how, would, how would we play out in any contention with Taiwan? How would we play out in any change, which I guess you'll have to agree that mm -hmm. it's changing in the Pacific Indo area. Uh, how does that affect Hawaii? How will it affect Hawaii? Well, I can't, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't think I'll check my closet after we drop off here, but, <laughs> but um, I don't I don't know how it's going to play out. I hope, my prayer is that Putin fails and withdraws, but we still have to, the forces have to learn and we have to, not just as a military, but as a government um, understand the need for practical deterrence. Deterrence failed. Um, and that's because the terms of deterrence were insufficient. President Putin was told that he would be mad as hell if he went into Ukraine. Is that different than what it is now? I, mean. <laughs> I, I don't think he I don't think he cared that we'd be mad as hell. Um, and so uh, and deterrence is a, is perhaps the most complex subject in in military and uh, and political thought, but we've got to think about what deterrence works without sparking conflict, because that's always the the balance that you strive to to achieve is being confrontational enough to deter legitimately without sparking conflict. We, China is not our enemy; they're our competitor. Mm. And Americans ought not want China to fail, but we also don't want them to succeed in running the world. We sure don't. We do not run the world. And, uh, and I don't think we seek to run the world. So um, if, if there's anything we should learn, it's, it, it's we should learn, uh, think about uh, and adjust our efforts at deterrence to be credible and, and not spark conflict. Would you agree with me that, um, that this signals a change in war? And we, we've seen it coming for a long time that war now is, is not only kinetic shooting war. War is, um, is everything you can think of. It's, uh, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, asyn asynchronous, uh, asymmetrical in every way. It includes uh, propaganda, it includes public opinion, it includes, uh, you know, trade and sanctions. I mean, so many non-kinetic weapons are on the table. Um, is this, has this changed the, uh, the asynchronous quality of modern warfare? And does that affect the United States? Should we be thinking and planning perhaps, um, you know, for more hybrid types of war going forward? Yes, and a little and a small no, lowercase no. Yes, I mean look at look at the economic uh, sanctions and 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 warfare, the cyber hacking threats that have been out there, the the use of information. The Moskva, it appears from my research on the internet, so not guaranteed. Its sinking may have been facilitated by a naval uh, hobbyist website that tracked the version the the movements in Moscow and said, hey, it's doing the same thing all the time. Um, so there, there, there are many elements that are very uh, 
uh, relevant to warfare that might not have been it, and both in an offensive and defensive capability or uh, uh, from offensive and defensive per perspectives, we should think about what that means. But the bottom line is still steel on steel, flesh on flesh. And this should also, or this should remind us of the human tragedy of war. Um, yeah. And it, because it's so visible. It's not that that hasn't been occurring in this century or the last one, the last part of the last one, but this is just more visible. And uh, yeah, well, it, that's that, still war. Steel and steel, we remember it, and it, it, we remember it, it acts as a turn, a turn for maybe a generation, maybe two, and then we forget it, <laughs> go yeah. back for more. Uh, yeah, and, and interest, Jay, if I can, I know we've got to wrap up here, but an interesting thing is Google uh, civilian casualties or percent of population casualties in World War II. Hmm. By far, hmm. the greatest percent of population uh, per capita killed in World War II is in where? Belarus, Russia, Ukraine, right there, right where this is. So it's not that they've forgotten history, it's like they've consciously decided to repeat it. Yeah. It's, it's an extraordinarily tragic connection with the past. Yes, it is. So one other thing I wanted to ask you about, and that is humanitarian aid. You know, um, the United States, as you said, is not interested in, in imperialism. It's not interested in, in making war. It's only interested in, you know, at least as far as my life, my observation is concerned in maintaining the peace in a moral, reasonable mm -hmm. way and it, to our credit makes us feel good and makes us all the more patriotic but one of the elements of dealing with a complex and sometimes violent world is projecting power even not necessarily using it and and that power according to the you know the kennedy school of, of uh, foreign relations uh, includes uh, soft power smart power different kinds of power one of the kinds of power um, that we have engaged in uh, fairly, you know, regularly is, um, is humanitarian aid. And I think we care a lot as a country about yeah. that. And so here we have an opportunity to render humanitarian aid to Ukraine, uh, which is being so horribly, you know, injured and harmed and maimed. Um, and my question to you is, um, uh, what effect does that have? Is, is that what I think it is, uh, a projection of power and a projection of moral power? Uh, and are we doing enough of it? Never enough. I mean, you can. <laughs> um, so I think there are two elements to the aid that's gone to the people of Ukraine. We're not talking about, about anti-tank missiles or anything now. One is to the refugees, the uh, 4 million plus, I think is their current count, largely in Poland. And that does that, what effect does that have? It alleviates suffering, doesn't change the situation, it alleviates suffering. And then there's um, aid in Ukraine to the population. And um, this is, I am not unbiased in what I'm gonna say, I'm a, uh, on the board of advisors of a group called the uh, nonprofit called Spirit of America. They are, uh, they, Jim Hake will be my guest Monday on Figment's The Power of Imagination. Their focus is on um, uh, aid to the people in Ukraine. And they're all non lethal aid. They don't take any government money, but they're delivering first aid kits, um, body armor, helmets and facilitating training for the large percent of the Ukraine population who's decided they're now in the army. And that's American aid, Spirit of America, obviously the name. Jim likes to say that Spirit of America is um, a non-neutral, non-government organization. They're on the side, the side of the United States and our objectives, and they facilitate success for military and state department operations in that way. I think that kind of aggressive in Ukraine um, uh, support is uh, in some measure beyond the bullets and bombs, uh, what is inspiring the Ukrainians to hold fast? Mm. It will be enough, God, I hope so. I hope they don't just hold fast, but 
get the Russian army out of Donbass, regain the territory lost in the south. Well, in terms of an American effort, you know, it seems to me that, uh, yes, uh, for the humanitarian and, and for maybe medical assistance, um, you know, it, it's okay. And the United States and its various uh, NGOs and agencies uh, should be operating in Ukraine to save lives, help people who have been wounded or who are starving for the lack of food or supplies. Um, and, you know, I, I feel that uh, if we're not there, we can be and we should be there. And the other, let me take it one more step and say that if we're supplying weapons and they're sophisticated, high-tech weapons as they should be, um, we have to make sure that the Ukrainians understand them and know how to use them um, to the, you know, to sure. the best, best effect. And for that, we, you know, we can't stop at the border. We can't teach them all of that in Poland. Uh, we, have, we have to go into Ukraine. Our people have to go in and show them and educate them. Uh, so it's on both sides. It's on the kinetic side. And it's on the humanitarian side where I believe the United States has a role to be and have its its agents and its um, you know its 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 helpers be be in Ukraine right now. Are they? Should they be? What do you think? I don't know. The, I know that civilians are. I don't think they're government aligned, but I knew do know that, for example, during the uh, war in Vietnam. The, the UR, U.S. Uh, was very significantly constrained by concern about the potential for Russian advisors at airfields and ports mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. Okay. Okay, okay. we're almost out of time. I would absolutely do that. <laughs> well, a lot of people would like, would like to do that. It's a thought that crosses many minds in this country. Yeah. How can we help? Um, so uh, we're almost out of time here. We are out of time, General. But right. uh, let me ask you, you know, if we've covered all the areas you wanted to cover, if there's any any a final point, a takeaway that you would like to leave with our viewers today. Yeah, the only win for the world is Russia leaves Ukraine. Um, conceding territory is, is a failure. Secondly, I hope China will reconsider its partnership with Russia and they would be foolish not to look at the tactical lessons learned because Taiwan is a far tougher nut to um, crack militarily. And so the unification of Taiwan with the mainland has to occur through peaceful means. Um, Vladimir uh, uh, Zelensky has said that Ukraine the government, the army is doing our work for us in terms of protecting the liberal world order. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Yes, I do. Can they succeed? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Thank you. General Dan Figley, thank you so much for appearing. Thank you Thanks, so Jay. much for all your contributions. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.